É, agradeço a participação de todos. É um prazer estarmos aqui participando da, é, é, dessa reunião científica. 645ª reunião científica da SBA CVRJ. Gostaria de agradecer ao nosso presidente Almar por ter aberto esse espaço aí para debatermos esse tema arterial que certamente vai interessar a todos. Temos hoje um, um convidado internacional é, com muita experiência no tema. Queria já agradecer a participação do Pablo Marques de Marino, que aceitou participar dessa reunião, apesar do, do fuso horário aí lá, são meia-noite e sete na, em Nuremberg, na Alemanha. Ele, ele é cirurgião vascular, é, trabalha na Clínico Nuremberg, que é ligada à Universidade Médica Paracelsus, Nuremberg, na Alemanha. É, trabalha no serviço que tem um alto volume, volume de cirurgias complexas. E, e casou semana passada e já está aqui conosco participando desse, desse evento. Rompemos a lua de mel dele. É verdade, é verdade. Entendeu a honeymoon. Mas, pa yeah. Paulo... Thank you very much for participating and accepting our invitation. Thanks It's for the very, invitation. It will, be, it will be very nice to hear from you. And now, uh, Elaine, vamos começar então com a, com a apresentação dele. E Bernardo, após o que ele apresenta. Você quer, o doutor Arno entrou? Quer falar alguma coisa, professor? Yeah. Boa noite a todos. Desculpe aí o atraso, mas culpa do hospital que atrasou tudo. Seien Sie bitte herzlich willkommen in der Brasilianischen Gesellschaft für Gefäßchirurgie. Vielen lieben Dank. Sprechen aber auf Deutsch ist, ich glaube, eine seltene Gelegenheit. Desculpe a saudação ao nosso convidado em alemão, mas como embora ele deva ser espanhol, mas trabalha na Alemanha, de vez em quando a gente tem que arranhar uma língua que... Está difícil de poder falar. <risos> Boas-vindas. Obrigado. Bernardo já... Obrigado. Então, vamos dar início à, à nossa sessão científica. Ela me pode projetar aí que o Bernardo pediu. Boa noite. Obrigado por me convidar e muito por essa invitação. Are my disclosures. We all know that both open and endovascular repair can fail over time with late aortic complications such as paragastomotic aneurysms and progression of disease with dilatation of the proximal aorta or complications associated to the endovascular repair. Both clinical situations are challenging as they frequently involve the paravisceral aorta and they often occur in patients that are older and they present more comorbidities than those treated for a primary aneurysm. Even though this used to be an uncommon complication, it has been on the rise in the last years due to a higher life expectancy of this patient and the widespread use of endovascular repair, including patients outside of the structure for use. This means that this challenging situation has become a common problem in reference centers for complex endovascular treatment like ours, which is why in the last 10 years in our hospital, we have studied and published different reports analyzing the role of fenestrated graft in the repair of these cases. The main reasons for failure after EBAR are a proximal endoleak due to extension of disease in the paravisceral aorta, migration of the stent grafts, and all kinds of problems related to a poor initial planning, such as short, conical, or angulated neck that was not suited for an EBAR in the first place. We have actually become very strict with what a healthy neck means over the years, an undersized stent graft, or a low placement of the device. When it comes to the open repair, the two main indications are extension of disease and paranostomotic aneurysms. One of the characteristics of these patients is that, except in the rare cases in which the surgical graft or the stent graft were placed very low in the abdominal aorta, in all the other patients, there's really no available sealing zone under the renal arteries. 
which is the reason why the growing experience with fenestrated devices has led to an increase in the use of these techniques in order to achieve sufficient sealing in the suprarenal aorta. But the fact that fever is visible in this patient doesn't mean that it comes without additional risks and complications. So we're gonna to try to sum up the main technical challenges involved in this treatment and some tips and tricks to try to overcome those. One of the first technical issues that we have to face during planning and execution of both failed open repair and EVAR is the short working length that we have in these cases due to the previous graft or stain graft. The short distance between the renal arteries and the bifurcation of the previous graft makes the treatment with a standard modular approach of a fenestrated tooth and a bifurcated graft cumbersome. Of course, one of the solutions for it would be to treat the patient using a proximal extension with a simple fenestrated cuff that seals in the previous surgical graft or endograft. But in our experience in patients with a short body, the risk of a type 3 endoleak is important. And therefore, nowadays, we always try to do a complete relining of the graft when it's possible. <laughs> to achieve that, we can also use as a possible solution a bifurcated graft with an inverted inner limb so as to be accommodated in a short working length that we have. You can see here the design in which the ceiling part of the, is inside the body of this bifurcated graft, allowing it to land over the bifurcation of the previous graft. Another important tip here, when we have a disease or a proximal to a repair that we think that it might dilate over time, is to be proactive and use a long body surgical graft in our primary repair in order to facilitate a further reintervention in case of progression of disease. If we are not sure that we are suturing the graft in a perfectly healthy aortic wall, we should forget about the classic grafts that were cut three to four centimeters of the bifurcation with a short body and long limbs and do instead a half body, half limbs, as this will make your life incredibly easier if we ever have to come back to that repair to treat a failure of the graft. Try to think about the younger surgeons that will receive this patient in five to 10 years and make this your present to them. And with the case with primary EVAR, we try to use a long body endograft when we think this repair might not be durable in the long term instead of a shorter body endograft. The next problem that we might encounter in patients with a previous EVAR is the catheterization of the stain graft. That is particularly important in cases in which the graft has an inner endoskeleton with inner struts, for instance, the endologics, because if we pass a guide wire between the stent and the fabric and we don't realize it, it can lead to a serious complication when we try to advance the new device. What we do in these cases is to go up with the wire and then withdraw an inflated balloon to confirm that we are not behind the stent struts, in which case we would have to take back the wire and start again. Don't be afraid of losing these five minutes to repeat this maneuver as many times as needed as it can save you an hour of bailout techniques later if you don't prevent this mistake. We can see in this video how we do this uh, maneuver and we realize that the wire is actually in between the proximal and cover stent. We can see how it moves down when we try to retrieve the balloon. And actually in this case, the proximal free stent is big enough so our delivery sheath could actually pass through this hole when we progress the fenestrated graft. And if we don't realize it, you can imagine the catastrophe that it can create if we deploy the fenestrated graft inside of it. That's why we took the wire out, started again, and rechecked that we were in the correct position with the guide wire this time. As you can see in the video, now the balloon is being retrieved without any resistance. In other ugly cases like this, the problem is, of course, to stretch the previous graft and to navigate through these angulations and elongations, which can be difficult if you don't get enough support. In these cases, the use of a through and through wire pulling from an axillary axis helps stretching the aorta and advances the graft, even in very angulated anatomy, as you can see here. And here we have the final result with the stretch anatomy that we achieve with this maneuver and the deployed fenestrated graft.
very rare exceptions if this stent is so collapsed that a catheterization in the right lumen and stretching is not possible a forced dilatation of the struts to break them and allow the new stents to be positioned can be a useful bailout technique if everything else fails another common issue with these patients comes with the orientation and position of the stent graft as you can see here in patients with several endovascular procedures it might be difficult to visualize the markers you can see here this salad of markings lines and points so it's important to plan markers in areas of the graft that won't be overlapped with the previous ones and to take all the necessary time needed to be sure that the position and clock orientation are right before deploying the graft as repositioning and turning might be cumbersome once deployed due to friction with the previous graft. And finally, the last important problem is to catheterize the target vessel through the previous stent struts. These cases can look like this, with lots of stents and dozens of markers in between. In these patients, we might need to pre-dilate the stent struts of the previous graph with a non-compliant balloon to gain access, even if we think that we are in the right position in relation to the strut. If this doesn't work, that means that we might be in the side of the strut that allows less space to access the vessel. So we not, might need to recatheterize again and again until we find the best possible entry between the struts. In a normal fenestrated case, we always try to keep the wire in the vessel at all costs and try to exchange different catheters, sheaths and balloons to access the artery. But in this case, it's the complete opposite. Don't be afraid to take out the wire and restart again until you find the proper entry to the vessel in relation to the previous stand graft. I'm going to show here an example of how things can go wrong very fast if you're not completely maniac, checking and rechecking everything in each step to show that it's going in the right direction. This is a 65 year old patient with a previous EVAR with a cooked Senate Alpha in 2016. The patient had two relinings of the right iliac limb due to thrombus formation and due to infolding as well as uh, embolization of a lumbar artery due to a type two endoleak in a different center. But the aneurysm showed progression during follow-up going from 67 to 80 millimeters and there was a suspicion of a type 1a endoleak in the CTA so he was referred to us and we planned to treat him with a fenestrated cuff. This was the proximal extension that we planned with three fenestrations and a double width scallop. So we advanced the device and we started with the catheterization of all target vessels without a problem. But as we already had two anal sheets in both renal arteries, we tried to release the same graft and we see that the proximal part of the device does not open even when we have the trigger wires out. We look closer and we see that there is a dislocated iliac stent over the proximal part of the cuff. One of these two relining stents that the patient received in the right limb before this procedure was around the proximal end of our device, preventing it from an opening. So we first tried to disrupt the stent with the cut balloon that we always have on the table for these procedures, but you can see here that it was not working at all. And the result after this PTA was similar to the picture before the dilatation with the stent all around the proximal part and not being dilated at all. We then tried with a high pressure non-compliant balloon and we can see here how it slowly manages to break the pyramidal stent, allowing the thin graft to expand proximally. This is the result of this first PTA. As you can see, it's a bit more open and once the resistance from the stent was out, we redilated with the coated balloon again to bring the proximal stent graft to the diameter of the proximal aorta where we wanted to seal. And you can see here the result. We continued normally with the stenting of the target vessel. And the completion and geography showed no proximal endoleak with patent target vessels. This is the image of the stent we got in the control CTA. We can now tell that we have seen this patient again last month for the one year control and he's doing well. The stent is still there and he has no endoleak and no new complications. So we really dodged a bullet there. 
to summarize a bit our experience with these cases, in the past years we have a total of 105 patients treated with fever after a previous repair, of which 35 had a previous open surgery and 70 a previous EVAR. Here is the graph configuration for these patients. We can see that more than 60% of them had a complete relining with a fenestrated composite graft, as we say, which is the configuration that we used the most in the last years, and 38% of them had a fenestrated cuff. The technical success in our series was 93%. From the seven technical failures in four patients, we were not able to catheterize instead of a renal. Another patient had a device with six fenestration and had an occlusion of the two standard left renal arteries, which had a very small diameter. In another patient, the bridging stem was deployed, was deployed in a branch of the main right renal artery due to a mistake in wire positioning, resulting in the loss of the kidney. And finally, one patient had a type 3 in the leak between the previous EVAR and the cuff. We treated him with endoanchoring between the two grafts three months later, but the endoleak persisted and we finally had to extend it distally with a, with a bifurcated graph, including an inverted limb. We can see here one of these technical failures in which we had an occlusion of the two small renal arteries. The 30-day mortality in our series was 1.9%. The first patient had a diffuse retroperitoneal bleeding and underwent laparotomy with abdominal packing, but he developed a multi-organ failure and died on the fifth postoperative day, and the other patient died two days after the procedure due to complications following bleeding from one renal artery. There were no cases of spinal cord ischemia. Five patients presented with major postoperative complications. Uh, the patient with the lost right kidney that we said before required dialysis. The patient with the occlusion of the two renal uh, arteries on the left side had a persistent renal function deterioration. Another patient developed a pseudoaneurysm in the femoral artery which needed to be treated surgically. One patient had a pneumonia and the fifth patient suffered a myocardial infarction. We had only one death related to the aneurysm during follow-up. This 86-year-old patient had a contained rupture nine months after the procedure due to a large type 1B endoleak. The patient collapsed three hours after admission, had an emergent open conversion and another center, but died three days later from rupture-related complications. During a mean follow-up of 33 months, 13 patients needed interventions, and as you can see in the table, the most common procedures were occlusion of the EMA or lumbar arteries due to type 2 endoleaks, relining of the iliac limbs, or relining an extension of the visceral, visceral vessels due to stenosis or endoleaks. So to summarize, dear colleagues, we consider the FIVAR as a rescue for failed previous EVAR and open repair is a safe and effective alternative to open conversion in selected patients, showing high technical success, low mortality and morbidity, and good midterm outcomes. For, the, for this reason, we consider it the best option to treat these cases if technically feasible, but one has to take into account the additional technical difficulties during planning and execution that makes it way more demanding than primary fever procedures. Muito obrigado. Pablo, thank you very much uh, for this excellent presentation. Uh, Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Very, very complex cases and that were dealt with uh, in a master infection, uh, master infection, very nice cases. And actually, you got a, a lot of challenges to to if. On those cases, demonstrated that the the kind of challenges that you do there in Nuremberg. I, I will start asking you some questions. Uh, which which breeding stent uh, is your preferred option right now? I know that there was some evolution during during the time people in general have changed it, but I would like to know which breeding stent is your primary option right now, or if you. You choose your bridge instant according to to any specific uh, any specific pro property of a stent of you use the one you have on the over the shelf. Uh, I I also would like to ask you uh, 
uh, on cases of uh, tortuosity. When planning for fenestrating uh, devices, fenestrated devices, if uh, which is the limit that ang angulation will uh, offer you when you use, you look a very angulated uh, neck, if you cons when you consider change it to open or going through into uh, a fenestrated fenestrated device project. So um, as for the fenest uh, for the bridging stands, we now use mainly three stands. So when when we have a fenestration and we have a vessel that is perpendicular to the wall and we know that we are going to get a position of the stand graph to the wall, we use either an Avanta V12 or a B graph, a simple B graph. Those are our two stands. We have actually now published our experience with Avanta and we are going to publish our experience with B graph as well. They both do great in fenestrated cases with uh, with with good opposition to the wall. The Advanta that we use at the beginning when we didn't have other options for branches or for inner branches or for IBDs does not do that well in these cases. So right now we use for for branches, inner branches and IBDs always a big graph plus. I'm saying always. Um, I'm going to say 95% of the cases. We also use some VVX. We also use some Solaris lately. We use some V Advanced, but those are residual cases. Like our workhorse for branches right now is Big Rock Plus because we think it's really reliable in the deployment. It doesn't shorten as much as other ones. And it has a lot of radial force and the patency that we got with it in branches and inner branches is very good. And um, when it comes to angulation or to conical necks or to, um, as I said in the presentation, we have become really, really strict with what the, an infrarenal neck really means. And an infrarenal neck for us is a parallel aorta that is not dilated. So like a conical neck is not really a neck. Um, neck that is 29 millimeters is not really a neck that's already a disease aorta a neck with thrombos a neck with that that's not really a neck of course this patients in these cases in which you still think is the best option for this patient either not to treat him or to go for it and hope that it holds and i have to say that we also are a bit biased on the other direction than many centers are because we we treat of course the evar cases just from from our area we treat the fever cases from a bigger area as a referral center but we treat the catastrophes basically of half of germany or even all of germany which means that we have a bias because we we see a lot of these patients fail and probably for each patient that we receive in which uh, it failed, there's two, three or 10 or 20 that actually still did well or, or still survived five years and then they died of another reason and it was good enough for them. But um, the first thing that we do when we receive one of these cases is ask for the pre-EVAR CT and see this. And, and that's actually the best way of learning what should be and what is not shouldn't be a neck for us is looking at this and saying okay this why wasn't this a neck in the first time why was this a bad option from the beginning why did it fail and the second thing that we think now is uh, that's that there was also this slide about it is um, plan it to fail well we we still do take these compromises like okay this this neck is still too good for a fenestrated or the target vessels are not good for a fenestrated, the patient is too sick for an open repair, let's try with an EVAR, maybe we are lucky, but do an EVAR that you will be able to repair if this patient comes two years later with one of these catastrophes, because what we think is not, uh, it's not proper is to say a patient, okay, you're fine enough to operate you today, but if in one year or two years you come with one of these terrible complications, we'll tell you, I'm sorry, but you're going to, Get with your endolic and not you're not fit for a repair anymore okay uh paulo would like to make your comments yeah. right now yeah uh, congratulations pablo amazing presentation uh as Thanks. we wait 
uh, uh, we was talking earlier, and of course that the main question here is probably uh, to prevent, you know, how to to not be here. Uh, but I, I want to highlight some points, and you was talking in, in this direction right now, because in Brazil we have a little uh, more difficult than you. It's harder to have a customized device. It's it's much harder. Uh, it we have uh, uh, financial problems. Uh, we have um, it, it's more more hard to find a center like yours here. Uh, so we need to adapt. We need to adapt uh, uh, and and to 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 play what uh, we have. So uh, talking in this direction that you was, there is uh, for example any device uh, that you prefer when you are thinking in probably uh, or possibly uh, need to 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 increase the treatment later. Yeah, there there's there's two, two main things. Oh, sorry. There's two main things that we take into account. If if we think, okay, this aorta might dilate over time, or this is actually like the suprarenal aorta may have a progression of disease and fail. There's two main things. First, we have to get our device inside and we have to be able to rotate it and to reposition our device. And second is we have to have space to from the target vessels to the bifurcation of the device. That means that... Um, we tend to use uh, stain graphs in which you can choose the length of the body. In our case, the Cook Zenit Alpha is our workhorse for that, but like there's other stents in which you can use a longer body. The longer, the better. Like it will make your life incredibly easier. If we think that it's not a good option and we have to go, for instance, for gore, we try to do a conformable because we have one centimeter or 1.5 centimeters more of body in which we can work when we have to come back. And the second thing is avoid those stain grafts that have a very, very narrow uh, limb up. A lot of the very low profile uh, stain grafts, like the Minos or the Incraft from Cordis or all of those, they have such tiny limbs uh, in the part that you have the, the overlapping with the, with the iliac limbs that either the device will not come in or it won't let you any space to do any maneuver to try to catheterize your vessel. So those two are the main criteria to choose the stain graph if we think that in the future we might need to come back and, and do a second repair to this patient. There is any free flow uh, that you really don't like to, to use in these cases? Any what? Free flow, any kind of free stand. Mm. Raw small bear stent. Yeah, um, we don't really take that into account. Like as 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 I said, that's normally not a problem because uh, I mean, if the, even if it's in the very middle, you always find a way. The only thing, and that I also say in the presentation, is you have to lose. You, you have to lose this mentality of doing a normal fever cases in which once you're in in the vessel, you just try to keep it there and try to advance whatever. If you have to catheterize the vessel five times or six times or seven times, you just do it. You have to find a good entry. And that that's normally easier than one might have think. Like it, that's always one of the sides that it is. And of course, there's maneuvers that we can do and uh, like we we pre-dilate with balloons so that it moves a bit this uh, to the side. We get a sheath in, in the balloon while we deflate this balloon to get the sheath in, in uh, next to this. But that's normally not... Uh, we would rather get a longer body with a free flow over the renal arteries than a short body and just infrarenal fixation. Uh, there, I have one more, more question, and I want to open this question to Bernardo and to Mateus. Uh, in, in your uh, service, in your hospitals, uh, uh, you, can you uh, repeat the results in the open repairs uh, taken off the, 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 the previous device? Because uh, my, my results in, with this kind of surgeries, I, I have a really uh, small series, but it is much worse than the, the big centers. So sometimes I, I, I push the boundaries to, to perform an endovascular complex case. Uh, I, I want you to know about you. Bernardo, maybe with, with uh, the Dr. Arno, you can 
have more uh, can can be more easy for you. But uh, you know, without Arno, what do you think about it? Um. Well, again, we are biased in here. We have such a big endovascular toolkit that we we tend to think first of an endovascular repair for most of the patients. Of course, in those in which we suspect or we have diagnosed an infection of the graft, then we do try to do a, an exploitation of the device. But otherwise, most cases go for an endovascular repair because, and that's, that's the thing that uh, you were saying before, like that that's the advantage. And actually that the main reason why I think this kind of case is good to centralize it in uh, big centers uh, is first, how many things, well, first, of course, the experience, like when you have done thousand frustrated cases, like it's easier that you will get through these difficulties afterwards. But the second and very important thing is how many materials you have off the shelf. Like in these cases, there's, the hospital is not going to make money with the patient. Like sometimes you have to use 20 different catheters, different guide wires, steerable sheets, like lots of different devices. If you're in a smaller center and you don't have those off the shelf, it's impossible that you can order the whole catalog of the endovascular momentarium just to have it for that day. So you, you're going to fail more, even if you're as skilled as it is. And actually, Professor Verhoeven, our hospital, tries to avoid to operate this kind of faces in other centers because of this. If you don't have your momentarium, you're you're lost sometimes. Thank you. And, and Bernardo and Mathilde, what do you think about the open repairs the results? Uh, Open, open uh, explantation is a is a complex uh, surgery, and we have some experience of uh, explantation in, in, in of uh, complicated uh, uh, previous repair. But as Pablo said, in order to to perform a, a complex endovascular case, you need to have all the material and all the material of the shelf. Sometimes we got some issues regarding uh, insurances here. And, and actually, uh, sometimes with very complex anatomy, an open repair could, uh, could be more straightforward. Actually, open repair offers uh, uh, other kinds of, of challenges. Uh, you need uh, an experienced anesthesiologist. You need an ICU uh, that goes uh, close to the patient and st stays in, in, in contact with the philosophy of the, the, the surgical team. So uh, as Pablo said, uh, uh, actually it's, it's a complex case that you, you need experience, you need material, and, but sometimes I think explantation might be uh, depending on the case of the anatomy, angulation, and, and and what you have may be an, an option. It's a case-by-case -case analysis. Dr. Arno, you'd like to complement something? Uh, I think I'll do it at the end. We still have one one debate, I think it's Matteo yeah. Gennari. No, uh, yeah, yeah. No, Pablo, uh, Paulo asked you this, about this question, but let, let call Matteo's right now. Okay, good evening. Good evening, Pablo. Good evening. Thanks for the great presentation. I think this is a very important topic to discuss because uh, every one of us is seeing a lot of uh, failing levers nowadays, and these are all challenging repairs uh, due to a lot of anatomic factors, as you mentioned. Uh, the first question I think you you already partially answered is what the, the your your choice in in a urgent setting in failed evers, do you use off-the-shelf devices such as the T-branch? Do you like uh, an open repair? And do you have a threshold for a, a diameter sac for safely ask for a custom-made device? Because these patients sometimes lost their follow-ups and gets worse with uh, 80 millimeters aneurysms. So do you have a threshold for safely ask for a CMD? Yeah, 
Um, that's actually a very good question. Um, we, uh, well, for it's different if it's, of course, a raptor case or if it's a symptomatic case or if it's just a big aneurysm for us. If it's just a big aneurysm, we try to still go for a CMD. And uh, fortunately, here in Europe, or at least in Germany, in our center, we can order emergent devices, which means that instead of having them in three months, we're going to have them in maybe a month. We do the measure ourselves, so we don't need to send it to the planning center. And we order it directly to Australia and get it sent back. So, of course, it's still four weeks and things can happen. And actually, we looked at uh, our data on that two years ago, if I don't remember right, like Thanos and I, and and we saw this mortality during the waiting time, and like the, we we do have raptors on on those, but uh, if it's just an asymptomatic aneurysm, we still try to go for CMD because we think it's the best uh, case for the best opportunity for the patient. If it's a really emerging case, a symptomatic case with a big endolic, or if it's a rupture. Then we see what we have. If we have the place, uh, we uh, we can use a T branch. We also have an off the shelf, uh, low profile T branch, which is actually a custom made branch device similar to a T branch, but that mm -hmm. we always have in our in our shelf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have also used in some cases um, stent grafts from different patients, like CMD patients. We normally have. Eight, nine, ten, eleven stain graft, like fenestrated stain graft from patients that are in the waiting list and that the stain graft is already in the hospital. So we look at all our folder with all the measure cases. We say, okay, what would we order for this patient if we had the time? And then we see what's similar. And if we find a stain graft that somehow will go for it, like will would work. We go for it and we use it and then we just reorder the graph for the other patient. And uh, of course, it's not the ideal choice, but in a rupture, there's no ideal choice. And we're not big. I mean, if if this patient is ruptured, like there's probably also no way that you're going to be able to do a good repair with just one chimney or two chimneys or whatever other option. And um, yeah, so that's that's normally our approach. Yeah. Nice. I'm asking that because sometimes here in Brazil have like a period to the health insurance to authorize the customization. So we end up doing more T branch than that we want to. And regarding the technical aspects of the these repairs that you showed, do you use preload systems and and you think inner branches can help with this difficult Reynolds catheterization due to threats? Yeah, uh, we use preload. On, we only use preload systems when uh, the angle of the vessel is very sharp, like when it has a sharp obtained down. Uh, we normally still try it from down, and we leave the indwelling wire in place just in case we don't make it from down. And if not, we can always snare it from the axilla and uh, go from up. And we do use some uh, inner uh, branches. The thing is that uh, we, and again, we also analyze our uh, results of the inner branches lately. And inner branches, any kind of branches don't do really well in renal arteries. They're in Mm -hmm. not as good as other options. Normally, these cases are either a type 1A in the leak, in which still you have somehow a neck next to the renal artery, or an early progression of disease, in which you're not going to be very far away from the renal artery. So, of course, the thing that works the best over there is going to be a fenestration. If we have to go up, because really the ceiling zone is upper, then yes, we can try to put an inner branch for a CDX trunk, which is our most used uh, case uh, lately. But we try to organize fenestrations for the renal arteries because the results in terms of patency are still better than with the inner branches. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Pablo, I, I have a, another question for you. I, I also like to know if, uh, if somebody from the audience want to, to ask some questions, just 
hold your hand on the the chat of the Zoom. Uh, do you think is there any space for endovascular on collagenous disease like Marfan, or right now all the cases you send it to open repair? There has to be a very good reason for an endovascular repair. I mean, the first and good reason in some places could be that you don't have any center that can offer good results in thoracic abdominal open repair, which might be the case in some countries or at least in some areas of some countries. Uh, we don't have that problem. Um, fortunately, we have two centers next to us, which are uh, Aachen in the north of Germany and Freiburg in the west of Germany, which have an extremely high experience on, uh, like with Professor Tani and with uh, Professor Jacobs in uh, open repair of this pathology. And we sent, I would say, 99% of the cases over there. I mean, only really if we, if we think that the patient wouldn't survive uh, an open repair and still we want to do a treatment, we will try to go for this. In this case, we always try to use longer bridging stents to really land in a very, very healthy aorta and to prepare it to fail well or to even do a reintervention that has to be open. But it is like, we still think that the first choice for those patients is an, an open repair. If you have someone that can offer good results on that, which is getting rarer with the time okay uh daniel drummond hello daniel uh hello Hi. hello pablo i'll send Hi. the lecture parabéns bernardo para o doutor arna para todo mundo na organização uh, uh, i have a question uh in brazil we have some groups that used to uh, place uh all uh, self expandable stand inside the visceral what do you think about it? Is it necessary or are you doing selected cases? Um, I think for branches is a very good option. We don't use it probably as much as we need it. And actually there's some data coming from other centers like from Gustavo Oderich, your landsman, and uh, other centers which are showing extremely good results with self spendable in the branches. Um, we are using it less first because we don't have it off the shelf. Second, because lately we have been doing a lot of the branches from uh, below and uh, with steerable sheets or with self-made steerable sheets that we do just pulling with a wire from the sheath. And uh, we've had some problems passing the, like for instance, the Solaris stent, which is one of the ones that we have off the shelf, passing it through these steerable sheets to get into the vessel. So I think in terms of patency on the long term, once you do it, perfect. And if you're doing it from an axilla, it's probably a perfectly good option if it has a radial force uh, to to send it. But we use it less because we do most of our branches from below now, right now. And when it comes to fenestrations, I think there's really no advantage on using a self-spandable stent. Like I think a bare metal stent will give you the radial force, will give you the more precise positioning and will help you then with the flaring that you have to do to seal that fenestration. So in in fenestrations, we really never use a self-spendable one. Pablo, uh, I have one more question. Um, uh, Mateus was talking about the Chibran and uh, I was thinking, and how often are you using the Chibran thing now in, in Nuremberg? In my time with you, I think I never saw any cases and we perform more than 100 cases at a time. Uh, so how are you with this today? Uh, we still don't use it a lot because, I mean, we use it for either immersion cases or as uh, Dr. Mateo said before, the cases in which the aneurysm is so big that we just don't want to wait that month or those two months to get the, the stain graft. The thing is that we are still quite afraid of, even if our numbers are good, we're still quite afraid of paraplegia. And with the T-branch, you're always getting 10, 15, 
20 millimeters more than you would have uh, hoped. Even if you do a branch stain graph, you can probably plan it in a way that you land a bit before. Uh, we tend we take into account what we the, like the uh, intercostal vessels that we see in the CT, especially in the sagittal reconstructions, to try to see how bad would it be to use a T branch, how many of those we would be uh, like sealing with a T branch, but we we still use it mainly in uh, emerging cases, and again in the cases that that had a previous EVAR or a previous open repair, normally it's not necessary. We either have a endoleak, but still with a neck, or we have a small progression of disease on the top, or we had a problem within the vascular repair or with the planning, but normally we don't have to go that high. It's not a type three abdominal aneurysm. We have to go that high to, to do it. That's a different pathology. And that's very rare that it comes to that. And when do you need to use a chibrant for a pararenal case? Do you think, uh, do you usually cut the, the first stance or make a, a, a window behind or, or no? Um, we haven't uh, done that. We have cut some stents. Uh, I mean, especially in these cases, as I said before, in which we have to use the stain graph of a different patient for another one, and we somehow have to make it work. The problem normally is that you're playing a kind of dangerous uh, game with the releasing device and with the maneuverability of your uh, stent. And if you already have a lot of friction inside of one of this and you're not able to reposition it or to rotate it, you can end up in a difficult situation. So we tend to avoid it. And if we really have to do it because it's a really big progression of disease and we have to land over there, we just take the risk of the paraplegia. We do everything that we can in terms of our protocol to prevent spinal cord ischemia, but we take the risk. Um, Dr. Arno? Well, uh, it's, it's really been a very outstanding presentation. I would like to Thank congratulate you. you for you know, you showed several situations that took to the, the failure of EVAR and how to deal with that. Uh, and most of all, I would like to congratulate you for the outstanding follow-up that you have from your patients, which is very, very remarkable. I think this is very important that you know exactly how are your patients doing for the rest of their lives. Uh, I think I only have to congratulate. Like to ask anyone else, thank you. The, like to make any question. So I, I, I'd like to make one last question. Yes, to Pablo. Uh, I, I think we are we are having a better understanding of the natural history of these hostile necks and the need of a more proximal landing zone. And in your practice, there. You in short necks and and just a reno, you usually extend for a supraciliac with four fenestration, or you sometimes do two fenestrations and a scallop, three fenestration and a scallop for for these elective cases. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, nowadays we extremely rarely do uh two fenestrations. I don't think in the last two or three years we have done any of that of those. So we always go for three fenestrations, at least three or four. Our most common uh, device nowadays is a four fenestrated graph. What we have done, and we also published it last year in a European journal, is some of these cases in which is really a, just a pararenal aneurysm. So there's not a type four, there's no visceral invol involvement. We do a four fenestration and we don't stand the celiac trunk. Um, we do a control. We do a, if there's a short distance between the celiac trunk and the mesenteric artery. Normally, it's going to be good aligned as soon as you stand the mesenteric artery. So what we do is we stand both renals. We stand the mesenteric artery. We keep a wire normally inside of the like we still catheterize it. So it's not a failure because we cannot catheterize it. That's a different case. But we still leave a guide wire there. And we do an angiography in a lateral position. And we see first that there's no endoleak from the celiac. So that that's what I mean. It has to be a 
real gestural pararenal aneurysm, which we know that it's going to seal in that part without the need of the celiac. And we see that there's good flow to antegrade flow to the celiac and it's not coming retrograde from the mesenteric artery, no stenosis. If that's the case, we don't even stent it. It saves time, it saves one stent, and we think that the stability that the other three vessels gives is more than enough to keep the stent graph in place. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very, very much. And my, my best regards to Margo and Eric. I will. I will give it from you. And I'd like to pass the words to our president, Dr. Almar Bastos, for his final comments and closing. Almar? No sound. Sem som, Almar. Fazer mais algum comentário, alguma pergunta? Gente, muito obrigado pela presença de todos. I'd like to thank Dr. Pablo eh, for the great... Eh... Como, é que eu, como é que eu falo aí, Bernardo? For the great... Presentation. Presentation, Presentation yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in this night, uh, thank you for your your time. Thank you for the invitation. This time, uh, it will it will be a pleasure to have you here in Rio de Janeiro in our um, presidential meetings in the future. I'll be really glad to join you. Obrigado, gente. Foi excelente. Obrigado à organização do evento que não é só minha, eu tenho uma diretoria científica, doutor Ardo, doutor Bernardo, e graças a Deus estão aqui comigo, e muito obrigado, acho que foi uma, uma, um excelente evento, tivemos perto de 40 participantes, e muito obrigado a todos. Queria que todos abrissem as suas câmeras é, para a gente tirar aquela foto. Dr. Pablo, open your, your camera for, for us to give a picture. Yep. 